uh, especially in light of what's going on with the Social Security Disability Insurance Trust Fund and the number of, of workers entering that program. Uh, so for those of you not at all familiar with workers' compensation, uh, this is an insurance system that's for job-related illnesses and injuries that's paid by employers. It's regulated by states. Some states, like including the state of Washington, which we're going to hear about today, has its own uh, publicly run state fund, and, uh, but other states have much different systems. And um, in two, 2012, which is the last year we have a good estimate, uh, the total benefits paid out in uh, uh, hang on a next second uh, it, uh, was uh, uh, 62 billion dollars uh, that estimate comes from NASI they put out a new set of estimates every year and that's about a 50 50 split between medical benefits uh, for medical care and, and income benefits uh, and that's that's a big number it, it's nearly half of what Social Security disability insurance pays out in benefits alone uh, so this is a very big program, but we often don't hear as much about it as we do about Social Security because it's run by states and every state has its own system. Uh, it's important, however, for Social Security in a number of different ways because the, it, the interactions uh, between workers' comp and Social Security disability benefits. The, uh, we know, for instance, that uh, between 17 and 36 percent of DI beneficiaries aged 51 to 61 uh, initially had a work-related injury. So this is based on some work done by some folks at RAND in 2004. And it is a wide range, of course, but even the low range of this percentage is a very uh, big number. There's also been some research you may be familiar with that um, suggests that the tightening of workers' comp benefits by states uh, during the 1990s uh, contributed to growth in Social Security disability insurance entrance. Uh, however, there's very conflicting evidence on this or conflicting interpretations of, of the evidence uh, by the two sets of authors that are list, listed there. And um, so I think right now that that issue is unsettled. But uh, you can see, and this isn't, the, this isn't the only set of work done about the intersection between the two programs, but you can see this really illustrates the, the importance of the two, uh, of workers' comp to Social Security disability insurance. Um, in fact, I would also recommend this, uh, a, a new article that was in the Social Security Bulletin recently where people had matched data from the uh, New Mexico workers' comp system to Social Security disability. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Gary. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the uh, today's seminar is has a number of implications for uh, for Social Security disability insurance, and I thought I would just alert the, to you to these before we go through and before I even tell you what what the speakers are going to uh, talk about. Uh, and the first area in which they have important implications concerns factors that contribute to growth in the federal disability program roles. As an economist, I, and I think many of you as well, often think of work incentives and other types of incentives that might affect uh, as being really of paramount importance to uh, growth in the disability roles. But uh, one other factor that, that we relatively rarely consider as economists is poor medical care. And I think you're going to think following the first presentation that we need to pay more attention to the problem of uh, inadequate medical care. Uh, the, the second area where I think you'll find that uh, important implications concerns early intervention. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions about adopting policies that would make it uh, possible to deliver services to workers who experience medical events uh, that are likely to, to end up having them apply to Social Security Disability Insurance, but to deliver them before they actually lose their jobs. And uh, a lot of uncertainty about how to do that well. And I think one of the things that you will find from uh, this presentation that is, in fact, those types of interventions can pay for themselves through reductions in benefit costs alone, uh, let alone other uh, possible, um, possible benefits. And uh, you'll also learn how they might 
do that. Uh, that is why they work and, and uh, the mechanism. So, so anyway, without further ado, I think those are important implications, but let's get down to it. We've got two speakers today, and they're going to speak about workers' compensation in the state of Washington. The first person is Dr. Speaker is Dr. Gary Franklin, uh, and, and he uh, is the medical director at, of the Washington State Department of Labor Industries, the Workers' Compensation Board there, and he's also a research professor at the Univers University of Washington. Uh, maybe some of you already know Gary, very smart guy, very well qualified to, to present on this work and really very interesting. And then the, the, uh, the second speaker is Tom Wickeser, who's been uh, working with Gary for some time, and he's an economist at Ohio State University and um, has you know, been doing a lot of the lead work on the evaluation of the interventions that have been going on in, in, uh, in Washington. So uh, without further ado, I will now uh, turn this over to Gary, who's going to do the first presentation. And uh, he's also shown that he knows how to control the slides, so uh, he will continue to do that. And, uh, and after, after Gary finishes, we're going to take five minutes for questions just about Gary's presentation, and then we'll go on with Tom's. Uh, again, we'll have five minutes at the end of Tom's about his presentation, and whatever time we have left, we'll throw it over open to questions in general. We're trying something different uh, this time for questions. Uh, we've, we're using a different software for the the, uh, uh, the webinar today called WebEx, and uh, it should allow you to raise your hand and then we can recognize you. We will unmute you so that you can ask the question in person. Um, if you're having trouble with that feature, you can always submit a question through the chat feature, and we will monitor those as well. In order to see how to, to raise your hand, you may, you probably will need to uh, go to the top of your screen where there's a tab that says Viewing Gary Franklin's Desktop. And if you pull that down and click on the Participants icon, then another little uh, window will pop up, and at the bottom of that window in the middle, you'll see an icon for raise your hand. So don't do it now, but uh, when it's time for questions, please uh, please feel free to use it. We'd, we'd really like to uh, hear directly from you as opposed to using the chat feature if we can. Okay, let's get started. Gary? Okay, uh, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, hi, Barbara Webster. <laughs> I want to acknowledge all the great work that uh, that Barbara and her colleagues have done at uh, uh, at Liberty Mutual. Um, I, I've been the medical director of the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries for a long time. Some of you may know that um, we are there's only about four states that don't have any private workers' comp insurance, and our state um, uh, in our state we cover two thirds of the state's workers. So we have a lot of data on all of the workers. Uh, we have every medical bill, you know, going back more than 10 years. Uh, so we can do a lot of outcomes research and other kinds of research looking at medical issues in relationship to, uh, to disability in workers' comp in Washington State. Um, this is probably the most important slide in my slide set. Um, this is an actual uh, a reflection of a study we did some years ago, but the same study has been repeated in, in many places and other countries, and the, the, the curve looks the same uh, every, every time people look at it. This is a disability curve, and it's the time uh, to leaving disability of all injured workers who start out on some disability. Now, the number of days of disability varies from state to state. In our state, you have to have four days of time loss to be on this curve. But you can see that uh, most workers uh, leave time loss very quickly, um, uh, but by about three months, um, the uh, risk of being on disability for a long time uh, goes up dramatically. In our data, if you are on disability for three months, the, the, your likelihood of being on disability one year later is at about 50%. So it doesn't take very long, uh, very much medical care uh, for that to happen, maybe one urgent care visit and two or three uh, primary care visits. And the problem is that doctors uh, in general do not recognize how uh, uh, the worker who is slipping down this disability curve could be losing their life 
in this system and losing their life in their community. So it is very important to uh, to keep uh, an eye on this stuff and to do best practices early on in the first weeks after an injury. Um, five percent of cases, five to ten percent of cases take uh, 70 80 to 80 percent of all of the expenditures in workers' compensation. So basically, if you're out here on the flat side of the curve, uh, you're one of the five out of 100 workers uh, who is uh, destined to, um, to go on to longer-term disability. So preventing that disability becomes uh, the highest calling uh, in workers' compensation. I even, when I lecture to our uh, claims managers and to self-insured TPAs, et cetera, I tell them that they're actually kind of like public health officials. They actually can, you know, by the way they uh, uh, affect uh, benefits, can uh, pay for things at work to prevent this long-term disability. The, uh, the framework of this is that, uh, you know, if you prevent an injury from happening in the first place, this is what this, uh, the OSHA does and state, state OSHA plans, that would be primary prevention, preventing the workplace injury in the first place. But if you're preventing the disability, uh, which occurs at three months, then you're preventing uh, that secondary prevention. And then uh, if you look back at the curve, if you're beyond three months, you can probably still do some intervention here in the uh, time frame from three months to one year and perhaps still get some decreased uh, further harm. One other thing I want to point out that uh, is not highly recognized is that the definition of chronic pain is about three months of pain. So if you're on disability for three months in workers' compensation, you are in chronic pain. And so the development of chronic pain is essentially the same thing as the development of disability in workers' compensation if you take out the catastrophically, the small number of catastrophically injured workers. So preventing the transition from acute and subacute to chronic pain is essentially equivalent to preventing disability in workers' comp or secondary prevention. We've done a lot of work, as have others, on what are the most important risk factor categories for predicting whether a worker will slide down that disability curve and become one of the five out of 100 who goes on to longer-term disability. We have focused, uh, to a large extent, on the uh, preventable um, types of risk factors. What, it is, what is it in the medical arena that you can prevent? What is it in the workplace arena? And what is it among the things that uh, we ourselves as workers' comp administrators do that might uh, lead to uh, further disability like delays and, and problems like that? The biggest thing on this list is probably the psychosocial variables and recognizing those psychosocial variables. These are not typically severe mental health issues. These are things like fear avoidance, catastrophizing, uh, and low expectations of return to work. The strategic focus in Washington State in order to, uh, to effectively do disability prevention has been a, a focus on uh, three uh, strategic areas. Number one, to identify efficient methods for identification of workers at risk for long-term disability. And we had a, a five-year uh, NIH grant to develop those factors related to these buckets of disability predictors. The second thing is to incent the delivery of occupational health best practices, uh, the care, care that might be sufficient to prevent disability in those first months after injury. And Tom Wickheiser is going to speak more about uh, those efforts. And then the third thing is to use best evidence to pay for services that improve outcomes and reduce harms for injured workers. That is, uh, if, if uh, a certain procedure uh, or surgery is, doesn't really work or causes more harm than good, uh, you should try to figure out a way to reduce uh, coverage on that or to not pay for it at all. From the work that we uh, conducted on the risk factors for disability, this was, uh, again, a large prospective study, uh, kind of like a Framingham of workers' compensation type of study. We did look at uh, all of the known and published risk factors, and we were able to come up with what I think is quite an accurate uh, six-question questionnaire which when used uh, in the first weeks after an injury is highly predictive of, uh, of long-term disability. If the first three questions are positive, um, the, the uh, worker has a 36% likelihood of being disabled one year later. The uh, second set of three questions um, 
which has to do with uh, uh, fear avoidance and uh, catastrophizing and, and work expectations is also important. Of course, it's, it's, more, it's important not just to screen for risk, but to also have a plan for implementation of best practices uh, once a, a person is known to be at risk or is seen to be at risk. And the kinds of things that we uh, have been doing here uh, is uh, applying graded exercise and reactivation, addressing low recovery expectations and fear avoidance through education, um, and to uh, add uh, additional services such as health services coordination services, which Tom Wittkaiser will speak about. But among the medical treatments, uh, what, what has contributed the most to the decade-long pattern of increased disability duration uh, in uh, workers' compensation? And in our view, um, that would be, uh, to a large extent, uh, opioids, spinal surgery, and, uh, and, and bad doctors. Um, there are other problems which are not that common, but which uh, in many, many cases lead to further disability, and we don't have a, 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 uh, an exhaustive list of those here, but that would include things like thoracic outlet syndrome. We also have found uh, that a large proportion of our, our pension cases uh, have had uh, multiple psychiatric diagnoses, including the dsm 4 diagnosis of chronic pain syndrome. Some of you may know that that, um, that uh, specific diagnosis, you know, diagnosing pain as a disease, has more or less gone away in the new DSM-5. So that's going to be an important issue as we move forward. This is what I call the uh, the Franklin curve, um, and it it's sort of a, a, a schematic to show on the far left, you know, zone one doctors, which are extremely high quality doctors. Um, zone two doctors would be very good doctors who can always use a little more education. Zone three doctors would be doctors who are doing things that are sort of gray care, not really gray care, not, not very good. Um, but zone four doctors, a very small percent, less than 5% probably of doctors who are doing care that no one would recognize as being uh, decent care and who are harming workers. So it's very important to fi try to figure out a way to stop that uh, extreme, extremely harmful care. So what we have done is we have established uh, in Washington uh, network standards uh, and le new legislation a few years ago established a statewide network, which is not a managed care network, but it is a network that uh, to get into the network, you have to pass minimum standards. We also have new statutory language, which defines risk of harm. And we're working on that now, particularly in regard to opioids and uh, surgery. The status of our uh, statewide network is uh, kind of mind boggling. We have allowed in over 20,000 providers, but a very small number of providers uh, under 300 have either not applied or were denied um, uh, uh, entry to our, our workers' comp system. These providers uh, are associated with an outsized amount of disability and uh, cost. Um, these uh, 73 providers who were finally denied uh, through appeals, et cetera, uh, were associated with $34 million a year in expense. I want to say a word about opioids and disability. Uh, this is uh, one of the major things I wanted to talk about, and this is above and beyond the fact that there are um, uh, deaths all over the country. Um, as you probably know, prescribed opioids have accounted for over 100,000 deaths from unintentional um, uh, death, uh, unintentional overdose. Um, these are mostly from prescription opioids, so these are not typically street users. These are people getting prescriptions from doctors. But we have spent quite a bit of time looking at opioids in the workers' compensation system, and actually Barbara Webster was the first person to publish a paper on this. Uh, this study here uh, was from our prospective cohort study, and we were able to, in this study, to look at uh, whether getting opioids early in a workers' comp low back claim, even when you adjusted for uh, how much baseline pain and disability and severity of injury there was, uh, how much that contributed to, uh, to disability. And what we found was just even getting uh, a couple of prescriptions or seven days of an opioid in the first six weeks after uh, an injury, a low back injury, doubled the risk of the worker being on disability um, at one year. And uh, Dr. Webster's uh, work 
found a higher uh, rate than that, and there have been several other studies that have confirmed that as well. Also, a lot of workers, uh, as you can see in this first bullet point, uh, get uh, opioids often at the very first visit, which is uh, probably inappropriate uh, to receive uh, opioids as the first treatment for nonspecific low back pain. We have uh, established new uh, guidelines in workers' compensation in Washington State. I'm not going to go into any gory detail here, but what's important about uh, this uh, uh, new guideline is that uh, it is very clear that uh, if you're getting if, if you're getting uh, an opioid, if you're giving a, a worker an opioid in the first in the beginning of a claim, and the worker uh, after a, a few days or a few weeks has not improved. Uh, meaningfully. So uh, having a definition of clinic, clinically meaningful improvement in function, and that would be at least 30% improvement in pain and in function if those patients are not that much better after the initial use of opioids, we will not allow uh, opioids to continue in those patients. We also have included a case definition in this new guideline for tapering um, uh, workers off of opioids because if workers are on opioids for three months, they are likely highly physically dependent and may, in fact, never be able to uh, come off of opioids from only three months of treatment. Because we have uh, been working on preventing the unnecessary chronic use of opioids in this uh, cohort in our workers' comp patients in Washington, we have dramatically reduced the proportion of workers who are still getting opioids uh, between six and 12 weeks after their injury. Uh, in 2008, that number, uh, the number of still getting opioids three months after the injury was around 7%. After some uh, state action on uh, opioid guidance uh, in 2007, it went down to about 5%. And now with our new workers' comp opioid guideline uh, addressing inappropriate acute and subacute use of opioids, that number has gone down to 1% uh, to or less. So because of the, uh, the co contribution of opioids to dependence and um, and likely to much more addiction than anyone thought previously. And by the way, some new information would suggest that the old definitions of addiction for street users probably uh, may not apply to uh, workers uh, with chronic pain getting their opioids from their doctors in a, in a doctor's office because you do not have to uh, have aberrant behavior or drug-seeking behavior. All you have to do is complain of more pain to get uh, more opioid from your doctor. So uh, this is a paper that was recently published in the journal Neurology in September. It was a position paper of the American Academy of Neurology, and it basically points out that the uh, imbalance of harm from opioids for chronic pain probably uh, likely, very likely far outweighs the evidence on effectiveness, which is very low. So there's low evidence of effectiveness uh, from opioids for chronic pain and very high evidence, uh, strong evidence of harm from opioids, including the uh, dependence and uh, initiation and perpetuation, in my view, of disability in workers' compensation, including contributing to potentially lifelong disability and uh, sp spreading out into the uh, other disability systems like SSDI. I want to move over now to the uh, issue of paying for things using evidence-based medicine. Some of you are probably not aware that uh, this is kind of a, uh, an unusual slide for this talk, but it kind of uh, is an overview of uh, how uh, our healthcare is regulated. And you can see that in order for a drug to, be, uh, to get approval by the FDA, two prospective placebo-controlled trials are required. But um, the uh, evidence uh, that is put forth to get a medical device approved is a very lower, much lower standard, uh, and 95% of medical devices are approved based on substantial equivalence to pre-existing devices prior to 1976. And most of these devices, even an implantable stimulator, for example, does not need to, to demonstrate that the patient outcomes, uh, clinical outcomes, are actually better. Mostly, what these uh, things, are, are, what these studies are meant to show, is an engineering effect that the uh, the uh, the simulator does deliver a charge. And it does cause uh, some uh, some change uh, where the where the stimulator is uh, placed. Finally, surgical procedures, a little-known fact, are not regulated at all. 
There is no uh, either federal or state oversight of surgical procedures. And so that really leaves it up to insurance companies, unfortunately, and other bodies to try to decide what works and what doesn't work. Uh, a surgeon can just go to a, uh, a weekend course and learn how to put a new device in for a lumbar fusion procedure. Uh, it's sort of a see one, do one, and do more. We have been looking at the outcome of lumbar fusion for a long time. This is a highly invasive procedure if you're not familiar with it. Um, it also is an extremely expensive procedure because of the hardware and the uh, orthopedic charges. This in, in private where in private commercial carriers um, is uh, often a, over a hundred thousand dollar procedure. Uh, and lumbar fusion costs in our state employees benefits board is the number one inpatient cost for the entire state uh, employees program. But this uh, slide represents outcomes of lumbar effusion in uh, uh, the Washington workers' compensation system. We have looked at this a number of times now, and the main number on this slide to pay attention to is that only one-third of injured workers who receive a lumbar effusion are uh, off of disability two years after the lumbar effusion. So that means two-thirds of workers are still totally disabled two years after a fusion. And in our data, we have now looked uh, backwards 10 years. Um, so those workers who received a lumbar fusion in the Washington workers' comp system, 44% of them who received a fusion 10 years ago are now on permanent disability. Lumbar fusion rates have been increasing uh, nationwide. Uh, it is um, much worse in some states uh, than in other states. And this, uh, this surgical procedure has the highest coefficient of variation between the uh, regions in the country, according to the Dartmouth at Atlas, um, a 20 to, 20 to one fold, uh, as high as a 20-fold 20, 20 difference in the rates of fusion being done in different regions of the country. Uh, we have also uh, repeated the study that we had done previously, the slide that I showed you earlier, and actually after uh, you know, 10 or 15 more years of development of new devices and new, new metal that is implanted, we found exactly the same uh, outcomes, uh, two-thirds of workers still totally disabled uh, two years after lumbar fusion. We have a little bit of good news. It's good news for Washington. It's Bad news for California, Brooke Martin uh, is a, a researcher at Dartmouth who used to be at the UW, has looked at the 90-day reoperation rates across the hospitals in workers' comp uh, in California and in Washington. And you can see here that all the, uh, the black uh, dots are um, the California hospitals uh, for the 90-day reoperation rates. And nearly every hospital in California is worse than nearly every hospital in Washington workers' compensation for these lumbar fusion uh, adverse uh, outcomes. And this is uh, some of the more detailed fusion safety data from Washington and California. And you can see here that the, uh, the, these are, uh, again, 90-day readmission rates, that the readmissions uh, range from 10% to 14% in the two states, device complications, wound problems, and life-threatening complications. You have to remember, these are mostly uh, 40 to 55-year-old people that are getting this procedure and having these uh, adverse events occur. I want to really quickly mention uh, the uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. This is a highly controversial problem. It's a uh, it's purportedly uh, the brachial plexus nerves, which leave the neck and go into the arm. The bundles of the brachial plexus are compressed uh, in that region, uh, and some surgeons, a few surgeons in every state, think that if they uh, do this extremely invasive procedure to un uh, un unlock the uh, pressure on those nerves will improve things, except the only problem is that most of these patients actually don't have any nerve problems at all. The diagnosis is made uh, purely by uh, asking the patient to do some uh, some things like raising their arm up and turning their head to the left and asking the patient, does that, does that make things worse? So that kind of uh, you know subjective diagnostic uh, capability is uh, is uh, not credible. So many of these patients have this invasive surgery without any any problem at all documented in their uh, brachial plexus nerves. And again, from this uh, study, we were able to demonstrate that 60% of these patients are still totally disabled one year after surgery. 
The other interesting thing about thoracic outlet, as I mentioned earlier, is literally only a, a handful of surgeons in every, every state that do these uh, surgeries. These are the uh, believers, and in our state, it is, uh, you know, it was two surgeons that did uh, uh, one third of the surgeries and uh, 12 surgeons who did two thirds of the surgeries. That was some years ago. More recently, it is literally one or two surgeons doing nearly all of the surgeries. The medical costs and the time loss uh, occurrence uh, after TOS surgery compared to after no surgery in those diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome is way worse uh, in regard to disability, 56% um, still disabled at one year and 40% still disabled at two years. Uh, and then the adjusted models aren't quite that bad, but they're still terrible. We also found that, uh, uh, you know, many patients who have this surgery have new complications, including new neurologic problems that weren't there before the surgery. We have now identified three or four patients in this state who have had phrenic nerve injuries from the surgery, one of whom uh, therefore had uh, life-threatening complications uh, with trouble breathing, because the phrenic nerve uh, supplies the diaphragm. I want to uh, finish up here by just mentioning quickly some of the new best practices that we're working on, and Tom might touch on some of this too. One is called activity coaching. This is a fantastic thing that was developed by uh, Mick Sullivan in Canada. It is a, a, a 10 week structured intervention, and it is aimed primarily at the psychosocial barriers to recovery, uh, directly addressing things like fear avoidance, catastrophizing, um, and uh, injustice. And uh, it, the great thing about this is that it's very low tech, it's, uh, it's not costly at all, and it can be delivered by uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, and others, even vocational counselors likely. I mentioned the functional recovery questionnaire earlier. And then we are also going to be uh, developing uh, similar kinds of best practices for transitions to improve the transitions between primary uh, health care and surgical care. So you all probably uh, have seen this Murray article in JAMA uh, in, in uh, 2010. Uh, I mean, the study was published in 2013, but the the one metric that I really liked in this, uh, this study was years lived with disability, um, and the top causes of years lived with disability, um, the top five causes, are low back pain, major depressive disorder, other musculoskeletal, neck pain, and anxiety disorders. This is workers' compensation. Those are the disorders that we see in our workers' compensation cases. So we recently, to finish up here, uh, tried to uh, get our actuaries to give us some data that would def try to define uh, probable cases uh, besides those getting SSDI directly in the workers' comp system in Washington State. And we recently published a paper in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine making the case that it is bad care in workers' comp that is leading to a lot of the disability in the system and bleeding over into the SSDI system. So the case definition that we uh, came up with uh, uh, and were able to uh, test a bit, um, the five uh, for the four criteria would be if the worker is getting a Social Security offset, if they've received cash benefits of time loss benefits for at least five years, if they've received a permanent partial disability award that is high, or if they are already receiving total permanent disability but not yet receiving Social Security offset. And using that information in the American Journal of, of an Industrial Medicine study, we were able to look at the percent of claims who actually had the offset in 1997 and 2007. It was between 2.1% and 2.9%. But then if you use those four criteria that we just went over, the percent of compensable claims who are highly likely to end up on permanent disability or SSDI was much higher at 5.4% in 1997 and 9.2% in 2007. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that poor quality or harmful care and workers' comp contributes to the initiation and perpetuation of long-term disability. The disabled patients generated in workers' comp are increasingly entering the SSDI system. Identification and early treatment can prevent long-term disability. It is also highly likely that these same potentially harmful health services are contributing to disability in non-workers' comp systems. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Gary. Uh, okay, so we'll take a few minutes here, but you need to raise your hand or submit something uh, in the chat box if you want to ask a question. I don't see any hands raised yet. Steve, if you see one, uh, just go ahead and recognize it. Okay, still no hands raised. Can I ask a question? I have one. Sure, sure we can take one from the room. Thanks. You talked about a disability offset, um, and I'm wondering if you could let us know what that means in your in your language. Okay, I'm sorry. Most states um, have uh, uh, workers' comp laws that if you uh, are you're in the workers' comp system and you're getting time loss uh, of any kind, and you end up on Social Security disability while you're still in the workers' comp system, that. Uh, uh, um, uh, amount of Social Security income will reduce the amount of time loss that's being paid. Okay, thank you. And it looks like Frank Newhauser has a question, so I'm unmuting you, Frank. Hi, Gary, it's Frank from California. How are you doing, Frank? I'm doing great. Thanks for an interesting presentation. It's really fascinating, and, uh, you know, I, I, I often refer to Washington as the place where research gets done on issues like this, and part of that is because you have that, as you mentioned earlier, that unique um, exclusive uh, state fund that allows you to collect uh, detailed health data. Um, so, but one of the things that makes Washington State um, unique uh, is that uh, until recently they excluded workers from making, um, from, from uh, allowing workers to do lump sum settlements and to close out cases. And so medical treatment um, often continues um, for, for long periods of time. And, you know, there are some studies out that suggest that worker outcomes are better when lump sum settlements are allowed. And I wonder if Washington State thought about allowing workers to settle both the, the pension and the medical side of their claims. Um, and let them proceed with decisions in the medical arena that um, where they have some contribution to the cost and make maybe better decisions. Yeah, I, I, you, you probably know a lot more about that, Frank, because I think a lot more of that happens so, like in California. Um, we did have a bill that passed a few years ago that would allow that kind of a settlement and workers that were at least 55 years old, but um, for whatever reason, it has hardly been used at all. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it, it has not, I, I don't think it's having much of an impact at all. Thanks. Thank you. Any other, Steve? There's no more hands raised. Okay. Well, I think we should uh, move on, but, but um, I, it's fine for people, if you want to indicate that you'd like to ask a question, uh, you, you could do that while... Tom is talking, and uh, that way we'll have you queued up at the end, uh, and we can proceed more quickly. So, anyway, uh, let's turn this over to, to Tom and uh, proceed. All right. Um, thanks. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for uh, taking time out of your day for our presentations. Let me apologize in advance. Our uh, son came home from California for Thanksgiving and was kind enough to give me a horrible. Head cold. So um, if I cough a little, as I say, I apologize. I'll try and get through this uh, without doing too much of that. So I'm going to be talking about, um, Gary referred to this, a, a very large and ambitious quality improvement initiative that Al and I mounted uh, in, the early, um, in the early 90s. I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> the design of it, some give you some context and background and then present some um, findings and um, conclusions. So this is the, just to kind of um, pay tribute to the great uh, scientific and administrative team. We had um, Gary and I in different ways kind of were um, the leads, but by no means the only people. Um, Bob Moots at L&I, Roy Plager Brockway and, and others at L&I made uh, important contributions, as did Deb Fulton Keogh, Terry Smith-Weller, and, and Jerry Gluck. So it was really a, very much of a, of a team effort. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about avoidable disability and workers' comp and then give you some um, 
information on the design and evaluation methods, present the findings, and then uh, some implications for improving return to work. But I, I guess, and Gary really mentioned this, the take-home point, I think, of both our presentations is that secondary prevention initiated early in the claim can improve outcomes and reduce work disability. And secondly, unlike you know, on the general medical care side with, for example, reducing risk of cardiovascular disease way down the line, um, workers' comp secondary prevention really does have um, almost immediate payoff in the sense that people return to work and then go off, uh, go off di disability. So again, just to highlight, uh, I think what Gary mentioned and Dave mentioned earlier, the Washington State organized the state fund system. Uh, it's administered by uh, the Department of Labor and Industries. All employees who don't self, employers who don't self-insure must, by law, purchase workers' comp insurance through the state fund, um, which insures roughly two-thirds of the state uh, non-labor, uh, non-federal workforce. So I'd like to say in presentations of uh, this type I give that there's the disability prevention is kind of a bad news, good news story. And again, I think Gary set the stage here earlier that workers who remain on disability for longer than a few months have greatly reduced chance of returning to work. That's the bad news. But the good news is really that effective occupational health care can reduce the likelihood of long-term disability. And this is the same curve that Gary showed. What we tried to do really in the intervention I'm going to be talking about is drive that blue line more toward the origin so that at the end of 12 months there would be fewer injured workers um, on long-term disability. And uh, I think at least to a very meaningful degree we, um, we succeeded in, in doing that. So the precursor to the Quality Improvement Initiative I'm going to talk about was a managed care pilot um, study uh, that L&I sponsored in the early 90s. And the idea there was really <clears throat> to answer the question, if you delivered care, if you delivered workers' comp health care through um, a physician networks where the on the medical side, um, that was paid for by capitated risk contracts. Um, could you improve outcomes and improve satisfaction and perhaps also improve costs? But LNI did not um, set out on this managed care pilot simply as a with a primary objective of containing costs. So this is the um, a simple um, bar chart showing the uh, <clears throat> um, results of our study. Behind this, there were, you know, the usual kind of multivariate analysis. But we showed that in the managed care arm, um, medical costs were reduced from 748 to 587. And that really wasn't a surprise to us. We didn't, we didn't know, of course, you know, we didn't have priors on the extent of, of, of reduction that might occur. But we generally thought that some um, <clears throat> certainly non-trivial reduction would occur. But what really did surprise us was the right-hand bars for disability costs, which were dramatically lowered. And part of the reason we didn't set up the, the evaluation to be able to disentangle, if you will, um, the various factors that could account for that reduction, but these, these managed care pilots had to deliver care through what we came to call an occupational medicine model. And so what's that? It's a model that required the clinic um, to have an occupational medicine board certified physician, to have on-site case managers, to really to use guidelines and to really make a ongoing effort to communicate with the employers. And <clears throat> we have other data on, on the extent to which uh, some of that occurred, especially communication with employers. Um, and, and I think this is the um, the result of that, that disability costs per claim were reduced from 625 to $342, um, and we published that. And, and But medical, or uh, uh, L&I, to its credit, um, then said, well, gee, we've learned something from this managed care pilot, but we can't do managed care in Washington State because 
We can't direct workers to any particular network of physicians or individual physicians. For this pilot, they got a waiver by the legislature, but that waiver expired. So what to do next? So L&I sponsored, um, and a group of us at the University of Washington participated in an 18-month policy study to try and figure out how, how can we take what we learned from managed care and within a voluntary framework um, use that to perhaps take the next important step, and that is to develop a new initiative that would try and improve quality and outcomes. And if I can advance the slide. Right there. Right now. All right. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about uh, in the remainder of the presentation is this um, initiative that we came to call the Occupational Health Services Initiative. So what was this? It was started around uh, 1998. The idea was not complicated. It really was to improve quality and outcomes um, and to enhance patient and employer satisfaction. It really was not managed care, though. Workers were not directed to, uh, to these pilots at all. They chose to go there on strictly a voluntary basis. There were no restrictions placed on provider choice at all. So what was the system redesign? We um, brought um, people out to Seattle, um, national experts and regional experts, as well as local folks around three areas, back pain, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, and extremity fractures, and had a, a full day um, kind of focus group activity that generated, uh, ultimately generated quality indicators that as part of this initiative, um, L and I then incented by paying physicians who perform these, what we call best practices, uh, added payment each time they did so. So different model than other pay for performance um, um, schemes, which really to date haven't shown uh, much, much effect. Um, and part of this, uh, an important part of this initiative was to develop community-based pilot centers for occupational health and education, otherwise known as COHES, and the quality improvement activities that these COHES um, performed was care coordination. They hired health services coordinators, um, mentoring, and uh, providing uh, continuing medical education for physicians who signed up for the pilot and disseminating treatment guidelines and best practice information. So this is a schematic of, uh, of these COHES. Um, the the uh, initiative was sponsored entirely by the Department of Labor and Industries. There was no federal money. Um, the Department of Labor and Industries also provided a large uh, um, a large um, contract to the University of Washington evaluation team to conduct an evaluation. The overall COHE and each of the two COHEs I'm going to talk about in just a second had business and labor advisory groups that turned out to be very important for reasons that I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation. And then the idea was that the COHEs would um, enroll on a strictly voluntary basis community physicians. And so there was no really bricks and mortar built here. Um, community physicians that participated did so in their own emergency departments in their own clinics. So there were two sites um, in Washington State. If you're going to do something like this, you have to have a site east of the mountains and west of the mountains. The culture is very different. Um, so one was in Renton, Washington, which is in the greater Seattle metropolitan area, just near one of the Boeing plants, and the other was in eastern Washington in, in uh, Spokane. So this slide shows uh, what the quality improvement components were linked to the quality improvement objectives, and we uh, organized them um, uh, as follows. We had what we called structural change components. That included physical continuing medical education. Health services coordinators were really the core of the 
structural component. Um, and they, though, <clears throat> they were intended to improve care coordination, to improve communication with employers, and to reduce provider administrative burden. And then there was also money um, that was available to enhance uh, information technology to improve patient tracking. And the financial incentive component was what I mentioned before, was really enhanced provider payment to promote um, best practices around those four items listed on the right-hand lower cell there. The mission of the accident report, use of activity prescription form, communication with employer, and assessing return to work impediments. So just a few words about the evaluation. Um, these are the numbers in both sites for the intervention group and the comparison group. The comparison group was um, formed by uh, all, K all uh, injured workers that were treated by non cohe physicians in the immediate um, catchment area. So we assessed four outcomes shown on this slide, off work and on disability at one year, post-injury, total disability days, and disability and medical costs. And we were limited to claims data, so we had a rather short list of um, covariate factors that we could include in the analysis. And these were age, gender, type of injury, provider specialty, industry, and provider claim volume. We used kind of standard uh, regression models um, that included logistic regression for the binary uh, outcome of on-off disability at a year, and then used generalized linear models um, to assess the other three continuous outcome measures. And then we did two important sub-analyses. Um, one was we um, <clears throat> separated back sprain cases and analyzed them using the same model. But many of these, <clears throat> I don't have the descriptive data that I'm going to show today, but many of these cases were relatively straightforward lacerations. So the injured worker might go to the local urgent care, get 10 stitches, and you know um, either go back to work or spend you know, part of the day at home and then return the next day. Well, obviously, improving care coordination is not going to do very much for that kind of patient. Well, on the other hand, back sprain cases are usually, if not always, almost more involved and oftentimes lead to prolonged disability. So if you're going to see an effect, you'd more likely see an effect among the back sprain cases. And then we were interested to see if we could um, identify any what you might call dose-response relationship among the COHE physicians to take a look at whether those that adopted best practices more often as opposed to less often had any different um, outcomes. <clears throat> so two slides here on the findings. This slide shows um, for both the overall sample and in parentheses um, back sprain cases. And you can see the, for the four outcomes, the percent on disability, disability days, disability costs, and medical costs. And the thing I would note is that in the overall sample, there were fairly large differences, as you can see, in the, in the baseline samples. So, for example, the percent on disability in the baseline sample was two days in the sorry, 2% on the COHE and 2.7% for the comparison group. And similarly, disability days, the difference was about 14 and a half versus 19 and a half. Whereas if you just look at the numbers in parentheses, you can see in the baseline samples between the COHE group and the comparison group, they were actually almost identical. This is a slide showing our overall results of the statistical models. Um, substantial reductions in um, the, the uh, risk of being uh, on uh, disability at one year, and a larger reduction in risk for back sprain cases, and what we call the high adopter versus the lower adopter cases. And you can also see the magnitude of the estimates for disability days and disability costs. The medical costs 
although negative, did not, um, were not statistically significant. But part of that reason is that the incentive payments, and in hindsight, we probably should have done it a different way, but the incentive payments are in, to the physicians are included in these medical costs. If you back those out of them, which you really should for this kind of analysis, um, these uh, medical cost reductions would be increased by about 40 to 50 dollars anyway, and probably would have therefore been um, significant also. Um, <clears throat> the uh, expenses that Ellen and I paid um, for this COE initiative. Um, included $55 per claim for enhanced physician payment. That's what I was just talking about a second ago, that that $55 is, uh, is included in the medical care costs and $60 per claim for administrative contractual costs. But accounting for these costs, the COHE still had a positive net savings of approximately $300 per claim for one year of follow-up. But that number increases over time and we're gonna be doing uh, some further work to actually nail that down. But it's important to note that these savings are short-term, just at one year, and do not include savings that I'm gonna talk about in a second here, representing long-term costs, in particular pension um, SSDI expenses. So we've recently obtained data on eight years of follow-up for the original COE cohort, and we've also, uh, Included in that new data set, um, secondary outcomes <coughs> that include pensions from labor and industries, SSDI eligibility, um, attorney involvement in the claim, appeals and reopen claims, and some very preliminary work I've done um, has shown favorable reductions in the rates for these outcome measures ranging from about 25 to 50 percent. This is the specific relative difference for SSDI for compensable claims, um, looking out as far as eight years follow-up post-injury, the control 3.4 of them were on SSDI compared with 2.5%, but I wouldn't, I caution you, these are very preliminary and we're gonna have to, <clears throat> you know, scrub the data and do, uh, do further analysis. So L&I is really building out this COHE um, going forward and uh, trying to uh, initiate what you might call a community-based collaborative that's going to include surgical and specialty care, behavioral health, which is an important aspect but oftentimes overlooked in uh, workers' comp care, chronic disability pain care, and then primary occupational health care. That really is the COHE. So uh, a couple of concluding points here. Reduced one-year work uh, disability and disability costs and medical costs were observed. Preliminary analysis of long-term outcomes for other measures suggests favorable differences. Um, there were positive net savings for the COHE um, and physicians adopting best practices more frequently achieved outcomes. <laughs> So a couple of final concluding points. In March um, 2011, the Washington legislature passed a law, um, largely on the basis of our evaluation findings, that expanding the COHE pilot on a statewide permanent basis. And currently, uh, the COHEs are delivering care in uh, virtually all um, but one uh, throughout 39 Washington counties. By July 2015, it's expected that approximately 3,500 physicians will be treating uh, more than 50,000 COVID patients on an annual basis, and we anticipate doing further analysis to document the effect of this expansion, especially on care coordination, which has become a billable service. So we will have accurate, 100% complete data on all care coordination services that are done through the COE, which uh, I think will really be a unique data source that will really allow us to nail down what is the effect of care coordination. Everybody talks about care coordination, but it really remains largely a black box. 
Um, and I think over the next couple of years, we'll really be able to make some headway in understanding the effects of that better. So um, that's it for my presentation. Thank you. I guess Dave will take questions for a few yeah. minutes on this and then open it up generally. That's right. That's right. So I don't see any hands raised yet. I'm going to wait a second. I've got a question myself, but I'd rather have hear somebody else first. So hopefully somebody's got something they want to ask. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Well, me again. I can answer. <laughs> um, can I go ahead? Sure, please. Okay. Are these COHEs being used by only workers' comp organizations, or do other insurance companies use them as well? No, now, I mean, <clears throat> other insurance companies. So if I have insurance through Aetna, and I throw out my back gardening, can I go to the COHE? Mm -hmm. um, I think, Gary, jump in, or I think the answer at this time is no. Okay. It's just for workers' comp. Okay, thank you. But I think one of the things that Dave is interested in thinking about that we may start to think about is, can this model be expanded to uh, provide treatment for non-work-related um, injuries? I will jump in for a minute. This is Gary. The uh, the uh, State Employees uh, Benefits Board uh, the Medical Director, um, Dan Lessler, is going to be, uh, uh, we're all going to meet with a, uh, a medium to small employers group, a purchasing group over in uh, Spokane uh, soon uh, because they are very interested in trying to use these kinds of concepts uh, in their regular health care. So I'm not, I'm not sure where that's going to go. But um, we're excited about the potential collaborations. Yeah. So uh, let me just jump in for a, a second. Um, Dave, have you, have you heard of um, Social Impact Fund? Yes, I have. Yeah. So in, there, in the November issue of Health Affairs, um, there's an article written by uh, someone on the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco on Social Impact Bond. And as I was reading it on the on the metro coming down here to Mathematica, I thought, gee, this I, I wonder if this might have some uh potential uh applicability to some of the things we've been talking about. Yeah, seems, I I think it does, yes. Yeah, it seems like it might. Yeah. We should probably have a follow up conversation about that. Um I, I also think the uh you know, the Work uh, Innovation and Opportunities Act, the replacement for WIA, uh, has some provisions in it that might make it feasible for a state um, VR agency to contract with somebody like COHE to serve uh, to serve workers who are still, you know, not in workers' comp but are are still employed. Um, so uh, I don't think that's I'm not sure if other people are talking about doing that, but there does seem to be an opportunity. So, um, I'm gonna, my question is more technical. I still think there's no hands up, right, Steve? We actually just had Todd Honeycutt raise his hand. Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead with Todd then. And he's unmuted now. Thanks. Tom, I, I have a question. I'm a little fuzzy on the COEs and, and how they operate. I'm, I'm curious about how well they work with the employers, or are they – mainly working with the, the individual worker? Well, there, so that's a good question. Um, they, in, in terms of people being formally participating in the COHES, that's really physicians. So they signed up in Eastern Washington, I, a much larger number now, but initially a few hundred um, physicians and Renton signed up roughly a few hundred physicians. And then these physicians who had been treating injured workers before um, then became part of this COHE system. And so where the employer came into it was that the health services coordinators, when a, when a injured worker started to slide down, if you will, that disability curve and maybe got stuck at, you know, at a month or two, um, then the physician could call up the health services coordinator and say, you know, I think this patient perhaps could do light duty. Um, can you call the employer to explore that? 
as you probably know, physicians by themselves almost never do that, simply because they don't know who the supervisor is, they don't have the time to do that, it just never gets done. And so that was a critically important role that the health services coordinators and some of the COHE physicians played. And that's really how the employer, if you will, was connected into, uh, into this. So it really came, came into play in later stages of treatment? If well, yeah, but not, but not so late because the whole idea was to, uh, you know, to intervene in, in various ways, including with simple phone communication to, to the employer, not at, you know, six or seven months, but more at, you know, three or four weeks. Thank you. I was wondering, how much variation is there in terms of providers themselves? So I guess I'm wondering, should we expect selection to influence the results, or if the results, or if this program is expanded more widely, would a different set of providers, would we expect to have the same type of results? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and the answer, I think, is yes, there was, as you might expect, some self-selection. Providers who were more interested in workers' comp, who had dealt more with the system, who were more interested and more likely to volunteer for that. And our one variable that tried to serve as a, as a proxy to capture that which turned out to be highly significant, was provider volume. Mm -hmm. So the low volume physicians, um, as you might expect, had different outcomes, would have different outcomes, independent of the COE than the high volume providers. Uh -huh. okay. Tom, let me follow up on that question. Um, I think quite a few of the people online are familiar with difference and difference analysis and uh, those who aren't will probably have a hard time following this, but um, you know, I, th I think in order to be uh, for that approach to produce unbiased results, it's got to be the case that the uh, two groups of physicians, um, the you know, the COHE physicians and the comparison physicians, from the pre-period or to the post-period, didn't really change the types of patients that they were uh, serving, that they, you know, for instance, suppose the COHE physicians decided, well, I'm going to get be more selective, so I'm not going to take patients who, you know, have a very high chance of disability uh, anymore. Or or maybe another yeah. example would be uh, the, the workers' comp claimants themselves, some of them who had long-term issues, uh, they knew they didn't want to be working with a COHE physician, right? So can you be confident that changes like that didn't happen during, you know, when the COHE was implemented and that um, they don't affect your results? Well, that's a great question, Dave. So one of the other, I think, assumptions of these DID models is that the rate of change is similar in both groups, and we didn't have enough pre-data to really nail that down. I guess what, I, I guess I would answer your question a couple different ways. Um, I think many, and Gary jump in here in a second. Um, I think many patients who went to these COE physicians were unaware of, of, of this whole COE initiative. I mean, it wasn't like the, um, the clinic uh, or a particular practitioner in his or her office located in Renton or Spokane, hung out a shingle that said, I'm, I'm a COHE provider. Um, so, so I don't know in the practical world of the way workers' comp works if there would have been that ongoing selection process. I guess another, um, uh, another couple of things that gave me more confidence in our results um, were the analysis of the back spring cases, they were almost identical. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't hardly, even if you did a randomized trial, end up with two groups more similar at baseline. And yet, the, if you look back at that one table, the, uh, the outcomes got worse for the control group and got uh, better for the, uh, for the intervention group. The other, I think, 
thing that at least gives me a little more confidence in terms of attributions, and that is uh, our findings with respect to the high adopter, low adopter um, analysis. So this really, um, we didn't have any control physicians. The control physicians were co physicians who just adopted uh, these best practices at uh, lower, lower frequency. And that uh, analysis, as, as you've seen, also produced um, uh, very, uh, you know, meaningful, meaningful differences. So when I, when I add this all up, I, I you know, sure, am I 100% confident there's no bias from some unmeasured factor? No, but I, 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 think, I think I'm confident enough that um, these findings are pretty genuine. Okay, fair enough. Um, if people have questions for Gary, too, we can take those as well. Uh, Steve, anybody else got a hand up? No, still no hands raised. Okay. Actually, Frank Newhauser has his hand raised, and he's unmuted. Okay, Frank, why don't you go ahead? Uh, this is more specifically for Gary. Um, I, I just wanted to understand something better you talked about earlier, and that was the change in the treatment of chronic pain between the DSM-4 and 5. What is What exactly <laughs> is changing, and how do you see that affecting workers' comp? Well, this is not a generally recognized uh, thing. It's something that, that we noticed. So DSM-4 was the first time that um, a diagnosis, a psychiatric diagnosis of chronic pain disorder was introduced as a standalone psychiatric disorder. In other words, if you have chronic pain, it's a psychiatric disorder. And a lot of our uh, patients that ended up on pension, uh, you know, very high proportion of patients that ended up on pension, um, ended up with that diagnosis and sort of in psychiatrist offices for months or years without, you know, improvement, without change. So we were pretty interested uh, when the DSM-5 came out and, and, you know, we were working on actually new rules that would um, say, in, in our Industrial Insurance Medical Advisory Committee, including a psychiatrist that's very active in the area uh, for any number of reasons, thought that we should press ahead with, with uh, actually implementing DSM-5, number one, because it no longer uses that chronic pain disorder diagnosis. It, it, it instead focuses on somatization, which is not a workers' comp issue. Um, and, and secondly, DSM-4 required uh, the use of the, um, uh, a, 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 a functional assessment instrument, the GAF, which only relates to psychiatric symptoms but does not actually capture improvement in function. So the new DSM-5 actually includes uh, recommendations to use the HUDAS, uh, W-H-O-D-A-S, uh, functional uh, assessment instrument, which we believe to be much better. So we're including all of those, in, those pieces in our new rules, which should be implemented in a few months. But those are the main reasons that we wanted to move to DSM-5 uh, as quickly as possible. Did that answer thanks. your question? Yeah, thanks. Any others, Steve? Uh, no, but we have one in the room here. As okay. I was listening to the first presentation, I was sort of wondering, okay, well, if these procedures or practices are so poor, why are they being done? And it seems like, okay, well, maybe it's part information, maybe it's related to provider incentives. In the second presentation, it seems like the intervention sort of got at both of those aspects. And so I was wondering, was there any sort of qualitative component to your research, and, or do you have any insight otherwise as to sort of what the motivation is to help solve some of these problems that are arising and improve the practices? Yeah, so I'll take a, a, uh, a run at that first, and Gary, you can follow up. That, that, that's a great question. Actually, we have not, and, and maybe we should think of it now that, you know, that paper came out in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine and Gary gave us talk. We have not for the COE cohort. I'm not sure we have enough cases, but maybe, and now we've got eight years of data, looked at differences in, say, the rate of lumbar fusion and the rate of opioid use. If these, the one would hope that we would see some meaningful, favorable differences. And uh, and that, that's, a, that's 
that's an insightful question. So I we so far we haven't thought of doing it, but we that actually would not be a bad I a bad I, I, I idea. Yeah. That's good good. Uh, this is Gary. The, the reason I had a slide on, you know, the three main strategic um, ways of getting at secondary prevention, number one, identify workers at risk, number two, uh, do the uh, incentivized uh, health care delivery innovation like the COHES, and number three, um, uh, don't, don't, you know, don't cover uh, things that, based on evidence, don't either don't help people or make them worse or hurt them, like opioids. Um, so, we use utilization review uh, techniques very systematically to do the last thing, and and uh, but 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 unfortunately, most workers' comp places do not have very strong evidence-based uh, UR, um, and so that's why you saw that difference between the California uh, and the and the Washington workers' comp uh, you know three-month adverse event rate. Uh, much worse in California, and that's because, you know, there's almost no control down there. Even though they're paying a huge amount of money for UR, they are not making these tough decisions. So in our view, you got you have to do both things. You have to incentivize on the front end of cases the secondary prevention sort of best practices. But until that, until we live in a perfect world where we're really preventing disability, you know, in big big time. Uh, we still have, you know, thousands and thousands of cases that have been on disability for months or years, and they're getting. They're they're a lot of the ones that are getting these uh, these interventions over and over again. Repeated spine surgery, repeated, you know, people marching up and down the arm with different kinds of surgical procedures. It's the reason that we published a paper is that I think it's highly unrecognized about just how bad the care in workers' compensation is. That was the purpose of publishing the paper. So let me just, um, this is Tom again, jump in with one other, uh, I guess, footnote. And that is, so I, I did a, a study, had nothing to do with this out in California. We did a, a statewide um, survey of injured workers as well as providers. And, and for the most part, and based on my 20 some years of working in this area, you know, everybody talks about the importance of care management and care coordination. But I think how those activities are done, for the most part, not always, certainly not in the case of L&I, I, really pretty much of a sham. And in California, they have these managed care organizations that are supposed to do some of this kind of stuff. Um, they're just big, far-flung PTOs. They really don't do much in Ohio. But well, I also use this kind of managed care organizational model, and and people that I talk to can't quite figure out what's done to whom. So I think I think one of the one of the important differences in this COHE model, even though this sounds very you know, pedestrian, is that it, it does at least get us a little further down the road of having some kind of coherent system and accountability where people know what they should do and on average they do those things um, much of the much of the time and I, and I think as far as you know other systems go um, that's usually not the case strange as it may seem yeah. thank you okay any others uh, there are no hands raised Okay, well, we're uh, just a few minutes left anyway, so uh, let me just encourage people again, as I did at the beginning, to uh, send us your comments, and both about this session and uh, about the value or lack of value of the sessions overall, and also if you've got recommendations for future speakers we should be getting lined up, uh, please send those along as well. So Gary and Tom, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now give you a, a virtual round of applause, which is nothing, of <laughs> course, but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this today, and I think this was very informative. Thanks very Goodbye, much. Everybody. Thanks, Dave. Bye.